collateral purposes to which I'll come, and it may be that out of those collateral, uh, collateral uh, uh, events, uh, there will be some reconciliation, or there may have been reconciliation in any event. But certainly, one researcher has, um, who's worked in Boston extensively, a woman called Lara Nettlefield, has found probably um, at least, I think, three collateral consequences of the trials, which are clearly beneficial. One, very straightforward, that soldiers have a better understanding than they ever did before of what their international duties are. Um, a second is that individuals, and in particular victim groups in areas like this, such as the Mothers of Srebrenica, learn from the processes of the trials that they are not themselves powerless and that they can indeed um, become legally and politically active. Um, and that's a good thing. I've now forgotten the third thing. If I remember it, I'll tell you what it is. But the, there are collateral benefits that have been identified. And those are certainly, certainly two of them. But as to reconciliation, I would be dependent on you, not the other way around. And incidentally, this is not false humility at all. But I, I, I do wonder how in generations or centuries to come, people will view the imposition of legal systems on uh, territories where the imposing lawyers work through interpretation, have no cultural knowledge of the uh, area with which they are dealing. And what's more probably, like all of the lawyers and judges in the ICT, why well, have no experience of being in a conflict. Not actually, or well, most of them, if not nearly all of them, never having been soldiers. I mean, it is an interestingly uh, skewed task force to put in to try somebody else's conflict. Um, and s sometimes, in, a, in my more provocative mood, I ask my American colleagues how, if in a few hundred years' time, when there's been a split, California's against the rest, or something like that, and Iran is in charge of the world, and it has its United Nations, and it says, fine, we're not coming in to try your conflict. Next question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I found it very interesting when you explain the importance of the soldier, the policeman, um, but increasingly, especially as we look at the last century, the role of public opinion, and of course, in the last couple of decades, the impact, the internet, that public awareness, public outrage, people are not more conscious of it. And I'm coming to my question, really, which is about the whole thing that we have now these international courts. Um, no longer sort of the national sovereignty thing is one thing, but now people are being tried internationally outside of their own sovereignty. Um, and I, I appreciate there is an enormous difference between what is the law and what is justice. And so my question is really, how do we define a criminal in that Clearly, in these cases of genocide, these are criminal cases. But do you foresee, again, am I twisting the meaning of the word criminal, when you see uh, national leaders clearly having responsible for thousands of deaths, not in the case of genocide or slaughter, but in starvation. When you look at the world today, there are countries where clearly there are great responsibilities on leaders where thousands of people die through starvation. Again, this I, I, I understand is not a criminal case, but do you think we might come to a point in history where we say, hey look, this is a criminal case, and if thousands of people have died through the act of starvation, where I know it's incredibly complicated, but we're saying we can starve people to death and you're not a criminal for allowing that to happen. 
it's kind of you to ask me um, a question that it would be an indulgence for me to answer um, in, in, some, in, in, in some ways because it's well outside uh, anything which I have experienced. However, um, I think there are a, a, a couple of issues, and I can only repose the questions for our audience that is going to be the, the people who, whose world is going to change to consider. And the, the, the last part of your question um, was a topic I was discussing the night before the last on a national basis. Uh, and the question that I was posing to um, one of the Supreme Court judges in our own country, asking him what benefit he thought the firepower of clever lawyers had brought to bear on our country, was to suggest to him that there may come the time, a time when the big issues for the lawyers working as partners with the politicians, if that's what they do, will have to address economic problems and say the divergence of wealth in this country is now a legal matter that has to be addressed and that if you want to find in the next centuries the issues that may match Brown and the Board of, Board of Education in America, the, the, the great seminal legal decision that changed things for America, um, it may be that in years to come in national systems like England where the wealthy are getting wealthier and poorer are staying where they are or getting poorer, and that's happening, it may well be that the law will have a function to play there. I just don't know. But what you're postulating really is either that or is there an international dimension to permitting starvation to occur, which should be brought to book in some kind of criminal or quasi-criminal way. And if, you, if the answer to that is yes, where do you stop? Why do you stop at this country and not at the neighbouring countries? Why do you stop at this country and not the wealthy countries? All of which I suppose just how difficult it is for our very unformed or ill-formed desires for a world order to come into being. And why it may well be a retreat from the world order. Don't, don't be under any illusion. The International Criminal Court, which people in a casual way see as the way forward and a milestone on the way towards world order, it, it isn't necessarily there forever. It's quite vulnerable and it could disappear. It's a long rambling answer, but I hope it deals with some of the questions that you were raising. Mr. Sapp. Uh, a question which is uh, procedural but also substantive. Uh, as we look at the trial of courage, which are already underway, the body presumably starting soon, uh, and then look at the way um, the Las Vegas trial and some others was delayed, uh, manipulated. Are there, uh, from your experience, changes in the procedure that you think uh, the Hague Tribunal and other international courts like it can and should do? which on the one hand fully protect the rights of any accused, no matter what kind of heinous crimes he or he's accused of, at the other time also do a better job of speedy justice, bringing these crimes to what people say is closure, uh, and sort of the other side of the equation. Um, yes, I mean, it's a, question, a series of questions that are often raised and no less important for that. First of all, the adversarial system which was imposed as an act of cultural imperialism on these courts by America and England and Australia is not necessarily the best system of trial, but it is the one that takes the longest period of time. So maybe other trial systems should be examined, and indeed, to some degree, the international courts are trying to take, or have been trying to take, without great success, uh, procedures from the civil system to try and make things quick. Secondly, the Milosevic trial would actually have lasted about two years, but for the fact that he was usually ill, we only ever sat three days a week, and we only ever sat four hours on those days. It would have lasted about two years if it had been run continuously on standard Western court days. But of course, two years is still, two years for a 10-year 
period of uh, alleged criminality in three wars is actually, by today's standards, pretty good. Compared with the uh, nine months of uh, the Nuremberg trials, it's perhaps not quite so good. So there's, there's still room for improvement. Will the judges find ways of dealing uh, more efficiently with um, potentially troublesome defendants? Well, one can simply say that one hopes so. I certainly hope so. Um, in the Milosevic case, the judges were criticised for giving in too much. Sometimes I made those criticisms myself. But I think that that's to be a little unfair to the judges because they were posed with a very difficult problem. They had to deliver this man a fair trial according to the standards that had been imposed by use of the adversarial system and had been imposed by saying he could represent himself. And I think that had we reached a conclusion of that trial, of course there would have been appeals on this or that, because Milosevic would not have been convicted of everything. He, yeah, I imagine he'd probably been convicted of some things. He would have appealed that, so on and so forth. But procedural appeals would have been very difficult for him because they had given him so much rope. Um, that apart, and these trials are just hugely difficult to deal with. And if you were now to look at a modern, and one of the reasons they're difficult to deal with is, to be fair, you've got even more paper that you've got to consider and make available. You've got more emails, uh, for example. Always. There's always more material, not less. Uh, and so finding ways of cutting back is, is going to be tricky. But yes, in hand, and I hope it works. Microphone? Yes. In your opinion, what do you think that should be the rights of the victims in, in the trials? Like, now in the International Criminal Law, International Criminal Court, they have more rights than in the tribunals from Yugoslavia or Rwanda. Yeah. So do you think that that's are the, like, the, the good path, they're going for the good direction, that the victims have more rights like for us, for, for money or for us, because they are like yeah. thousand victims in that kind of I, I, Yeah, let me give that one. Um, it happens that it, since I left the Yugoslavia Tribunal, my work in this field has tended to be more for the defence side than otherwise, or close to the defence side. 